Our gospel reading for this Easter Sunday is from the gospel according to John chapter 20, reading verses 1 through 22. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb. And we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the Scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them. And he said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them. And he said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. So grace and peace to you this Easter morning uh, from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, so I think it was about five, five years ago, thereabouts, I can't remember exactly, uh, but it was my first time giving the message on Easter. And so I had this idea that I was going to go up to the pulpit with a fish sandwich in my hands. And I was just going to proceed to take a big bite, stand there and chew it while everyone looked on. <laughs> Presumably very confused. Now, the reason I didn't do that is I ran that idea by my wife, which is probably all I need to say about that. (laughs) And yet, here's why I wanted to do that. Right after the resurrection, one of the primary things Jesus did with his disciples is he ate bread and fish with them. A fish sandwich, right? Bread and fish. Anyway, the reason he did that is he wanted to show them he wasn't a ghost. 
You see, it wasn't just that his spirit survived or that his love lasted. It wasn't Celine Dion, Jesus going on, living in our hearts. It was really him. And so Jesus literally eats with his disciples in order to show them, it is me. I was dead and buried, now I am alive and risen. And so when people begin to see the risen Christ, first of all, they're terrified by this. This is not normal, but on a deeper level, they are changed by this. The resurrection of Christ opens up a new dimension of reality for them. So there is a new hope that they have. You see, in the Old Testament, it had talked all about something called a new creation. And so now people are beginning to have this confidence that there will actually be a new creation. And that that new creation has actually already begun in Christ. And on top of that, a new creation is what he's going to begin to work in their lives. Even now. And so with that in mind, what I want to do today with this message is I just want to look at two ways in particular, that the new creation can, and I would even say should, break into this old creation that we live in. Uh, That whenever people are open to the risen Christ, these are the main ways you're going to see him make something new out of them. Uh, So let's start with the first thing. Now, some of you know this, that right after college, I was substitute teaching. I spent most of my time at different high schools, many of which were in this valley in particular. But you see, I also spent a lot of time at one particular elementary school over in Canyon Country. It was called Mitchell School on a street called Goodvale Drive. And so sometimes they would say over the loudspeaker in the morning, this is Mitchell School on Goodvale Drive, the place where learning comes alive. (laughs) Which ironically made pretty much everyone want to die. I mean, even the kids knew it was corny. Uh, Anyway, one thing I remember about subbing there is quite often they would have the substitute teachers do yard duty at recess. And so you'd be out there on the playgrounds watching the kids as they played these games. And I think one thing about kids is they have essentially the same social dynamics as adults. It's just that they are way more out in the open about it. So there were two things in particular I would see on the playground. Uh, One is when the boys would pick teams. You've probably seen this yourself. Let's say they're playing basketball. There'd be two boys as team captains standing on one end of the court, and they would just go by one by one picking the teams. So the crowd of boys is kind of whittling down as they go join their team, and yet when you get to the very end, there's always that one kid that no one wants on their team. At the school I was at, it was the same kid every day. He was a short, kind of dorky kid who was just really bad at sports. He was also just really awkward. He had this voice almost like he had an accent, but it wasn't. So there was nothing cool or redeemable about it. And then on top of that, his name was Leonard Bedasian, which when all the other kids have names like Robbie Myers or Sean Smith, It's pretty tough sledding with the name like Leonar Bedasian. So on the playground, you could see a definite pecking order among the boys. In fact, whenever you see this, whenever they're picking teams, often the boy who is left at the end, they won't even say that kid's name. It'll just be like, ah, man, we got him on our team. And so that kid, what he will do is he will just put his head down as he walks over which tells you that he is, in fact, ashamed of himself. So that's the boys. The other thing I saw was the girls. Whereas the boys were usually really into sports, the girls usually just got into groups and talked, which I'm not so sure that changes much when you grow up. Just saying. (laughs) Uh, So you'd have these groups of girls who'd always break off into groups of about three to five was the typical number. You'd also have some bigger groups of like eight to nine girls, or you would even have just two girls who were really close, like BFFs, right? Uh, But the point being, everyone had a group at recess. And yet, not everyone. 
You see, there'd always be the girl who was left out. She'd be all by herself, so she'd go sit under the trees toward the edge of the playground. No one could see her. Or she'd just stay inside the cafeteria at the lunch tables. It seemed like no one wanted to be her friend. Now, usually it wasn't just because she was shy, although that sometimes played a part. But often the bigger factor is she just didn't fit in. That could be for a bunch of different reasons. For instance, if a group of girls was dressed all fashionably, right? It was like ripped jeans, form-fitting tops. This girl would be in old sweatpants and a baggy t-shirt. Or if a group of girls had perfectly clean, done-up hair, this girl would have tangles and grease. Sometimes she would be the girl who hit puberty early and was taller than everyone else. Sometimes she just didn't know how to have a conversation. She was awkward. Sometimes on top of all of that, she had a weird name. Kids can be brutal with names. You can see why some parents feel so much pressure picking the right one. All the cool kids had names like Maddie, Bailey, or Emma. But this girl's name would be more, something more like Dawn. Which if your name is Dawn, I don't say that to be offensive. Uh, it's just one of the girls where I was subbing, her name was Dawn. And this Dawn in particular was very much an outsider. And so pretty much every time I saw her out on the playground, she would have her head down. Which again tells you she's kind of embarrassed about herself. And so that's what I saw every day at recess. You'd have your Leonars, who were never chosen by the boys. You'd have your Dons, who were never befriended by the girls. And I'm pretty sure you had all sorts of other kids who in the secret of their hearts were doing everything possible to fit in and maybe they were somewhat succeeding. So their insecurities never stood out and yet most kids were never quite sure of their standing and never quite knew where they belonged. I see on a lot of playgrounds which are a microcosm of adult societies, one of the things we learn is in order to have value to people, in order to be chosen, in order to be befriended, in order for you to get attention, affection, and ultimately love, you've got to perform a certain way. It's that way in school, for instance, where kids either embrace or reject each other on the basis of social performance. It's also that way in some families where parental love is based on your performance as their kids. So the parents show a ton of affection for the daughter who is a doctor, but almost none for the son who is an artist. It's that way in some marriages where one spouse's affection is dependent on whether the other person is doing enough. It is that way in college when you're making new friends. You've got to prove yourself all over again. It's that way on social media where either the quality of your picture or the politics of your post determine your acceptability to others, measured in terms of likes. It's that way when you get a new job. You want to be embraced at work. It's that way in a lot of churches where you have insiders and outsiders. It is that way in just about any human organization and just about any human relationship that in order to be embraced by someone, You've got to perform a certain way. If we go to our passage, and we just read at the beginning, one of the people that runs to the tomb of Christ is a woman named Mary Magdalene. And one thing about Mary Magdalene, her performance in life was uneven at best. In fact, at one point in her life, she was just kind of a mess. She used to be demon-possessed, is what the Bible says, which just means she was caught up in a bunch of sin that she could not break free from. Some people think she may have even been a prostitute for a period of time. We don't really know that for sure. It's just kind of alluded to in a particular part of Luke. But what we do know for sure is when it came to the life of Mary Magdalene, it was not at all perfect. 
And in fact, on the contrary, it was filled with problems. And so she's at the tomb of Jesus weeping. She thought he was going to be the one to save her. Instead, he just died on a cross. It was horrible. And so what happens in the passage is Christ has been raised. She doesn't know it yet, but it's actually the new creation standing right in front of her. And the two two of them begin to have this interaction. She doesn't recognize him, and what she says at first, or what the passage says at first, is Mary thinks that it's, quote, the gardener that she's talking to. That's what she thinks. It's the gardener. And it makes sense. The tomb is, in fact, in a garden. And so she just assumes this guy she's talking to, just another gardener, which here's the thing about that. Maybe that does not mean much to us. But if you think about it for a second, who was the original gardener? The OG, right? (laughs) The original gardener, that is. Uh, It was Adam. It was Adam. The Garden of Eden. The old creation. And if you remember that instance, Eve's performance in particular was not up to snuff. In fact, she had just led them into the fall. She felt totally foolish. She was an abject failure. It was very obvious. She was hiding herself from God. She cannot bear the thought of being seen by someone. And so what was Adam's response to her? God asked them, what happened? And Adam's response was to go, this woman is what he says. You can almost feel him pushing her away as he says it. He will not even say her name. And if Eve's, hang, if Eve's head was not already hanging down, it definitely is now. And so if you go back to our passage, Mary's just kind of assuming, great, it's another gardener, another Adam. Just more of the, this woman. In other words, just another one of those messages that instead of healing my heart or setting me free, is just going to make me hang my head and hide my problems. And yet, no. It's not. You see, because this is a new garden. A new creation. With a new Adam. Jesus, that is, is the new Adam. And so instead of this woman, what does he say? Mary is what he says. That is literally one of the first things out of the mouth of the risen Jesus. One of the first utterances in the new creation. It is a name. And not just any name. But the name of a woman who is beat up and broken inside. And so what does she do in response? First she has her head down and for maybe the first time in a long time, she looks up. It's incredible. You see, because he is not just saying her name in order to get her attention. No, he is reversing the whole way that this fallen world works. That whole idea that we learn early on in life, right on the playground, that in order to have value to people, in order to be chosen, in order to be befriended, in order for you to get attention, affection, and ultimately love, you've got to perform a certain way. That's done. So done. That's the old creation. It's a fallen idea. And now that Christ has been raised, it is time for a new creation to begin. A new idea to rule our hearts and minds. That at least when it comes to Christ, his embrace of you is not dependent on your performance. It is dependent on his. On the cross, that is. The thing is, if you read the Gospels, so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all point to this. 
that right before Christ gets crucified, everyone's kind of playing this weird game of religion. You can totally see it. Uh, what I mean by that, and that weird game of religion, they're trying to figure out who's in and who's out. And everyone's doing it. Followers of Jesus, people who don't follow Jesus, all trying to play the game. It's kind of like our cancel culture today is what it kind of looks like. Uh, you've got to say the right things in this culture. You've got to have the right opinion. You've got to get with the program. Get educated, and if you're outside the bounds of the movement, then you better hide it really well. We will shame you if you do not think like us. Was the thought back then, and something tells me it has not gone away. I know a lot of people will say, I can't believe we're doing this to each other. This is horrible. And yet, come on. Religious people have been doing this forever. This is just the new religion. And so the thing is, right before Christ gets crucified, almost everyone is playing that game of who's in and who's out. And yet, as soon as Christ goes up on a cross, what a lot of people begin to realize, at least anyone who is honest, they begin to see, oh my goodness, all of us are out. Literally all of us. You look at the crucifixion, not one of us is righteous. They could talk among themselves. None of us defended him. All of us abandoned him. We've all got our demons. Which pretty much just means we're all Mary Magdalene. And on the one hand, the crucifixion of Christ should cause every single one of us to hang our heads. And yet on the other hand, in the resurrection of Christ, he calls us to look up. And in particular to see that on the cross as he died, his head hung down. What that is meant to convey, he took all the shame that we feel. All the sin that we hide, all the burdens that we carry. He took it on himself. And so what that means for us is no more head down and hiding. Also, no more finger pointing and shaming. No more playing the game of religion where we're always competing to see who's in and who's out. Instead, it's living a life of repentance. Not religion, repentance. Where we're always confessing that by nature, we're out, brother. But by grace, you and I can be healed. And so can everyone. You see, because in the resurrection, something new started. And unlike what Mary first thought, this Jesus that we gather around today for Easter, he is not just another Adam. who precisely because he felt insecure himself, this was Adam's whole motivation, he felt insecure himself, and that is why he cast a bunch of shame on Eve. It's a game that has never stopped. And yet it can. It really can. And it should. If only because Christ is risen. There is a new creation and unlike Adam and unlike pretty much the whole world we live in, his embrace is not conditional. His grace is uncontainable and when he rose from the dead, instead of dissociating himself from the people who deserted them, him, he called them by name. And so that's the first way you can tell the risen Christ is at work, making people new. It's that instead of people puffing up their chest with pride, or on the flip side of that game, hanging their head in shame, we can lift up our eyes with humility and emanate the grace that we have been given. Let's go to the second thing. I'm going to call the first thing that we just talked about unconditional embrace. It's part of the new creation. 
Uh, the second thing I'm going to call inexplicable power. It's also part of the new creation. So unconditional embrace, inexplicable power. Uh, in order to illustrate the second one, I want you to imagine you get overtaken by a wave. Maybe you've had this happen to yourself. Now you're out in the ocean. You get in over your head. The waves are just huge. And so what's happening is you're getting rolled in the water. It's a miserable feeling. You start to become totally disoriented. You don't know which way is up, which way is down. You don't really have any power over the situation. And so you're kind of fluctuating between frantically trying to save yourself and just totally giving up. It's this horrible situation. You really need to breathe. You can't, and so you're thinking to yourself, oh my goodness, this is it. I'm going to die in this water. And yet, here's what happens. All of a sudden, the lifeguard wraps his arms around you. And you don't see him under the water. It's kind of murky under there, but you can feel his embrace. It is unmistakable. And so you're immediately thinking to yourself, oh my goodness, finally! He's going to save me. He's going to pull me out of the waves. And yet he does not do that. And instead what he does is he puts his mouth to yours. And he breathes into you. And it's completely inexplicable to you. Some people refer to it as a mystery. But that breath that fills your lungs, it is not a normal breath. You see, because it never runs out. Ever. It's weird. You don't know how it works or why it is, but it's literally an everlasting breath that has filled your lungs. And so now instead of fluctuating between being frantic in the water or giving up on your life, you just begin to swim. And don't get me wrong, the waves are still there, they're still incredibly powerful, and yet it does not have the power to sink you anymore. Which in a sense means you actually have power over the wave. At the very least, you don't fear it one bit. The thing is, it's not because you're naturally brave. It's because of that supernatural breath that the lifeguard has breathed into. Uh, So if we go back to our passage again, the last thing that Christ does, and this is in verse 22, it's the last verse of our reading, and what he does is he breathes into his disciples, and when he does that, he says, receive the Holy Spirit, is what he says. Here's the thing about that. If you remember when God created Adam and Eve, what did he do? He breathed into them. That was how he brought us to life, the old creation. And yet ever since the fall, that breath of God went out of us. And the only breath we've had in our lungs ever since is our own which maybe that doesn't sound like much of a problem. Like, I could breathe fine, right? Uh, But you see, also ever since the fall, this world has become wave after wave after wave after wave. We have no real power over it. And even if we feel like we're kind of good at swimming through life, we are incredibly weak in comparison to a lot of the waves that we'll have to face. And if we're just being honest, sometimes it does feel like perhaps we're starting to sink. And the truth is, someday we're all going to drown in this water. We're not going to make it out alive. And so that is precisely why so many of us in life fluctuate between frantically trying to make our lives secure on the one hand and giving up on our life altogether on the other and just letting those waves roll us. And yet what our passage is saying is there is a lifeguard, friends, who's jumped into the tumultuous waters of this life. You see, when he was up on a cross 2,000 years ago, he was under the biggest wave that this world has ever seen. And in his last moment, what it says is he breathed out. That was the last thing that happened on the cross. Christ breathed out his final breath, it says. And I know this sounds weird, 
But that was not his breath that he breathed out on the cross. It was ours. You see, because that was not his death. He was dying on the cross. It too was ours. And the reason that matters is it means we can have a new breath in our lungs. And it's completely inexplicable, which is why some people call it a mystery, but the breath that he gives us is an everlasting breath. It never runs out. It never fails us, fails us if only because it's the breath of a new creation. In particular, it's the breath of Christ himself. And so in our passage, he breathes into his disciples, whoosh, that noise makes, which is meant to convey to us he gives his own spirit to his followers. And don't get me wrong, we're still in the waves. <laughs> And in fact, the waves of this life are just as powerful after as they were before we became new. And yet, if you have his breath in your lungs, they don't have the power to sink you anymore. Which means, in a sense, you and I can actually have power over the waves. At the very least, we don't have to fear them one bit, not at all. And it's not because Christians are naturally brave, it is because of that supernatural breath that that lifeguard named Jesus has breathed into us. That is maybe the biggest evidence of a new creation. It's people who are new. That's that we can have a new breath in our lungs, a new spirit in our lives, a new power in our hearts, the result of which is instead of being frantic in the ways or giving up on your life, you can just start swimming, my friend. You can stop being afraid. You can handle things with poise. You can even look at the wave of death itself, that big and final wave. You can look it in the face and not be the least bit afraid. What a powerful life that would be. And if you want that, receive the Holy Spirit is what Christ says. You see, because he is making all things new. He himself is the beginning of the new creation and he is preparing a people to enter into it. He's calling us each by name to step into it even now. And he is filling us each with power to live out his very life. So if that is new news to you and is of interest, you and I should really talk. That'd be good. Uh, if you've heard it before but you want to grow in his grace, I think all of us, we want to grow in his grace no matter how many times we've heard this. Uh, but if that's you, let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ. That he came to bear away the fallen nature of the old creation and to make something new out of it. Uh, more specifically, to make new people out of it. And so God, we pray that on this Easter you would open us up to that new life, that you would renew your work within us, that you would begin it in those for whom it has not yet begun, and that together we would reflect the goodness and the glory of Jesus Christ who has saved us by his grace. It's in his name that we pray and all God's people said, Amen.